Barry Levin Inc., which is about a 40-person firm providing medical record coding and audit services to hospitals throughout the New England area and Mid-Atlantic. He is also president of Barry Libman Education, a provider of training and education for HIM professionals nationwide. Barry is recognized for his in-depth knowledge of coding and reimbursement issues and is often called upon to provide education and training on coding updates and coding issues. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Barry Libman. Barry? Thank you, Maria. Today's presentation is um coding clinic for ICD-10, an update. We're going to summarize some of the more relevant coding clinics um, as well as um, recent issues um, contained within those coding clinics. First and foremost, um, the reason this is so important is that we stand on the edge of just beginning our great new adventure with ICD-10. And um, the compliance date for ICD-10 is seven days away. Um, at this point in time, we are prepared. We've done the hard work. Um, we have the aptitude to take on ICD-10. We have the skill to do so. And at this point in time, um, the final step is really to review coding clinic, one of the more often overlooked steps in the education and training process for ICD-10. Um, the first item I'd like to point out is um, just a reminder um, of CodingClinicAdvisor.com. CodingClinicAdvisor.com is a relatively new process given to us by Coding Clinic with which to allow us to pose questions to Coding Clinic. You probably recall in the, in the old days, you would either write a letter or fax a letter to Coding Clinic and you were never really quite sure where that letter went if you didn't receive a response um, very soon. Um, this is an online process that creates accountability between the user and Coding Clinic. One registers with Coding Clinic Advisor, you submit the question, and you receive a tracking number, which is the huge improvement in the process. And at any point in time following that, using that tracking number, you can go in and check on the progress of your question to see um, where it stands in the being answered process. And while not all questions are answered directly in the publication Coding Clinic, sometimes Coding Clinic will take the time and actually write the individual a letter if it's, a, if it's an issue that perhaps doesn't seem um, big enough to bring to the publication, but um, Coding Clinic wants to make certain that you receive an answer to your questions too. You may actually receive a personalized answer as well. Let's have a look at the current state of Coding Clinic guidance for ICD-10. Right now, there are currently 11 Coding Clinics out in our hands available for use. Um, I make the point that we have five coding clinics back from ICD-9, back when ICD-9 coding clinics contained both advice from 9 and 10, and there are five of those. Um, oftentimes when we talk about coding clinic for ICD-10, individuals forget that there are those five historical documents whose information um, is still active and relevant for ICD-10. And then we have Coding Clinic for ICD-10, CM, and PCS, which was published in earnest as of first quarter 2014. And we now have six of those available to us. Um, the sixth one was published, um, the, which was second quarter, was published actually at the very beginning of third quarter. Coding Clinic is a touch behind in getting their publications out, and that one was published July 6th. Right now, um, at the end of third quarter 2015, we're anxiously awaiting um, coding clinic advice for third quarter, and we're looking forward to any additional guidance that coding clinic can provide to us in these early days of ICD-10. Next, I want to talk about the transition to coding clinic. Um, first quarter 2013 Coding Clinic tells us that there are no plans to translate all previous issues of Coding Clinic for 9 into 10, since many of those questions are specific to code use in ICD-9. Um, however, it's generally understood that um, certain coding clinics that aren't code specific, that are general concepts with respect to documentation, um, are still valid moving forward into ICD-10. So not all of the ICD-9 coding clinics are believed to be sunsetting um, next week, and I wanted to bring that to your attention. Next, we have um, the thoughts as to the hierarchy of guidance. First and foremost, we must follow the conventions of the classification. And next, we must follow the official coding guidelines. 
And in the hierarchy, coding clinic is actually third, following the guidelines and the classification. And we know this because coding clinic, um, the official guidelines tell us, as you see in the middle of the page, that the instructions and conventions of the classification take precedence over the guidelines, giving us instruction that the conventions um, precede, supersede the coding guidelines. And that there really is no specific statement as to where coding clinic stands in the hierarchy, and it is generally understood that coding clinic um, is third in that group. Worth noting that adherence to coding clinic guidelines and the conventions in coding clinic um, is required under HIPAA, just to, to make that point, and that's given to us in the official coding guidelines. Today's topics, um, coding clinic provides to us a tremendous wealth of information for use in our daily work. Um, today, we're going to review each of the categories from which Coding Clinic provides us guidance. First and foremost, we're going to look at some Coding Clinics that tell us some um, operational approaches that will be the same in 9 as they are in 10, and that creates a great comfort level um, moving from one classification to the other, knowing that certain concepts and rules will remain the same. Secondly, we're going to look at guidance that is drastically different. Um, some, some very distinct areas where our coding practice and how we look at documentation and how we report those conditions is going to be completely different in 10 than the way we handle those in 9. Thirdly, we're going to look at some corrections to the classification. As you might expect, building a classification is a huge undertaking, and in the course of doing so, some mistakes will, will have been made. Um, we will. And until those mistakes can be corrected in the fiscal year 2017 version, we have to use a few workarounds that are given to us in Coding Clinic. Um, fourth, we're going to look at some corrections to previous Coding Clinics. Um, as we all know, learning the process and the rules for ICD-10, especially that within the procedure classification, has um, been a bit of a challenge. And even those folks at Coding Clinic who provided us some advice from back in the early days um, late 2012 and early 2013 have come to learn some things about the classification and are going to describe to us some corrections. Next, we're going to move on to a, a range of coding clinics that empower the coders, that allow the coders to make certain decisions that we would not have otherwise been allowed to make in ICD-9, but we will be able to make those decisions in 10 based on these coding clinics. And lastly, we're going to review certain complex issues. Um, these complex issues, um, we'll look at them, um, contain a range of multiple coding clinics that tell us how to handle um, a range of clinical circumstances within each of those um, issues, and we'll look at those. And if we have time at the end, we're going to have a brief update on um, in, in IPPS, the Inpatient Prospective Payment System 2016, a quick update because it's our impression that most of us have not had time to study that in detail and a quick survey might um, be of benefit to us. First and foremost, we're going to look at a coding clinic that um, helps us transition smoothly, item that is the same in 9 as it is in 10, and it speaks to the basic foundations of documentation, which is a very good place to start. First. Is, um, the questioner asks, is there a guideline or rule that indicates you should only use medical record documentation for that specific admission for coding purposes for that admission? And it's a three-part question. Does each visit or admission stand alone? And can the coder go back to previous encounters to get information for reporting that encounter? And even as you read it, you get a sense of where this question is going. And the answer actually takes two slides to explain. And it's some, this, this slide summarizes the issues from Coding Clinic. The documentation for the current encounter should clearly reflect those diagnoses that are current and relevant for that encounter. Um, very important statement. Secondly, um, conditions documented on previous encounters may not be clinically relevant on the current encounter, and the physician is responsible for diagnosing and documenting all relevant conditions. Most important statement here is that a patient's historical problem list is not necessarily the same for every encounter. And these second and third paragraphs really speak to the nature of the problem of the electronic record and perpetuating problem lists from previous encounters and the, and the problem of cutting and pasting and moving forward. 
The fourth paragraph tells us that it's the physician's responsibility to determine the diagnoses that are applicable and report them and that the recurring conditions should be documented in the medical record, meaning chronic conditions, and we wish that were as easily seen in the record as that guideline tells us. The answer goes on to tell us the real answer to the question succinctly. If the condition is not documented in the current health record, it is inappropriate to go back to previous encounters to retrieve this diagnosis without physician confirmation. Um, the next paragraph tells us that this is an area where educators, and this is really about continuous documentation improvement, um, to address helping clinicians improve the documentation by identifying areas um, that they can do a better job. And the lastly, it points out, and this is the point, that this information applies to both ICD-9 as well as ICD-10, so that when this was published in 2013, it reminded us that this is the way it was in 9, and this is the way it will be in 10, creating a certain confidence that we can go forward collecting clinical data and reporting diagnoses um, in the same fashion as we did in ICD-9. Next coding clinic is second quarter 2013. Um, the, the questioner states and, and reverts back to an old coding clinic, um, Q3 2008, that um, tells us that decompensated indicates there has been a flare-up, an acute phase of a chronic condition. And the question is both general and specific. Can this general definition of decompensated be applied moving into ICD-10? And for example, if that were the case, what is the correct code assignment for a patient with chronic systolic heart failure that is currently decompensated? And the answer is as you would expect, that you would assign, and they give us a very specific ICD-10 code, acute on chronic systolic heart failure for decompensated systolic heart failure, allowing us in 10, as we did in 9, to equate decompensated with the essential modifier acute. And as previously stated, decompensated indicates there has been a flare-up in acute phase of a condition. Um, and this is being a general response allows us to transfer that concept to the notion of decompensation across all conditions in ICD-10. And the third coding clinic that actually um, gives us comfort by knowing there is a certain approach in 9 that continues on into 10 takes place in the coding clinic that addresses urinary calculi fragmentation and evacuation. The clinical, the questioner describes the clinical circumstance that a patient presents for transurethral treatment of a calculus of the left renal pelvis via ureteroscopy. Endoscope inserted, the stone is initially fragmented by lithotripsy, and the remaining fragments are removed endoscopically. And the, and the question is really a two-part question. First, what is the body part value to be assigned, as well as what is the root operation, fragmentation or extirpation? And the answer um, takes several slides, but actually, because when you look at that one, we see the circumstance where the patient has really two procedures performed. One is the lithotripsy to destroy the calculus, and the second is the actual removal of the calculus. And, but in fact, the answer tells us that there is only one procedure code to be used, and this is worth evaluating. 0TC48ZZ, extirpation of matter from the left kidney pelvis via natural or artificial opening done in an endoscopic manner. Um, and here is the answer. We go on. One moment. There we go. Um, the fragmentation would not be coded separately since it is inherent to the extirpation. And that is not necessarily intuitive. I would have, when I tried to, this example, would have thought that we would have applied two procedure codes, one for the fragmentation and one for the extirpation, the removal of the solid matter. Um, the explanation in the third paragraph goes on to tell us that the index actually tells us the correct way to answer this question. The index to procedures under the term lithotripsy with removal of fragments instructs us to see extirpation, telling us to actually skip over and supporting the first line telling us that the fragmentation is actually inherent and that all that we need to code is the extirpation. The fourth sentence tells us 
that instead the objective, and that is really how we address the PCS classification, to determine what is the distinct objective of the procedure being performed. And in this instance, the distinct objective is to remove the calculi, and that um, the lithotripsy is really part of the means by which that is achieved. And that the, secondly, as you recall, the question asked um, what was the correct body part as well. And the last sentence tells us that code selection of the body part value is based on the location of the stone at the beginning of the procedure. And since coders um, like to know the source of these sorts of things, I wanted to show that while it may seem odd that we're not coding the lithotripsy in ICD-10, this is exactly the same way we handle this circumstance in ICD-9, proving that this concept um, travels smoothly from 9 into 10. Here you see the index in ICD-9 where you look up lithotripsy. And lithotripsy of a ureter is coded to, currently for the next few days, 56.0, which is removal of, um, of um, an object from the ureter, transurethral removal of the obstruction from the ureter and renal pelvis. So you see lithotripsy leads us to removal of the, the item from the ureter or renal pelvis and doesn't actually allow us to assign a lithotripsy code. When you look at the index in ICD-10 at the bottom of the page, you see lithotripsy, and the instructional terms are either to see fragmentation, or if that lithotripsy is done with removal of fragments, it sends us to see extirpation, meaning that the lithotripsy in 10 is inherent in the extirpation procedure as well. So just wanted to show you that uh, for this fairly commonly performed procedure. Next, we're going to look at a few items that are completely different in ICD-10. And this question, a very important question, refers back to an old coding clinic in first quarter 2004 that says, in ICD-9, we assumed a relationship between diabetes and osteomyelitis when both conditions are present, unless, of course, the physician indicates that they are unrelated. And the very important question stated is, is the same relationship between osteomyelitis and diabetes true for ICD-10. And most of us, including myself, were frankly shocked to see that this is completely different in ICD-10. The answer being no, ICD-9, ICD-10 does not presume a linkage between diabetes and osteomyelitis, meaning the provider would need to document a linkage. Um, osteomyelitis related to, osteomyelitis due to diabetes, meaning that if you do have these two diagnoses um, recorded in a patient encounter and there is no relationship stated, um, they would be coded separately. Um, diabetes unrelated to osteomyelitis. Um, this is an important uh, item to keep track of because this is a huge difference, as I said, from 9 into 10. Um, and of course, there are, on the inpatient side, reimbursement, reimbursement implications with respect to this change in codes and the sequencing that might be associated with that. Next, I just want to talk a little bit about, as long as we're talking about osteomyelitis, is osteomyelitis in the ICD-10-CM index. You will notice um, what we really find is, by looking at the index, that we cannot actually code a specific osteomyelitic site of the body without a qualifier of acute, um, without a qualifier of chronic or subacute. Acute, chronic, and subacute all appear at the same indentation level. Um, and if you do not have a, a, a qualifier of, of acuity, one cannot actually move down and identify through the classification a site of the body that has osteomyelitis. And if you don't have acuity documented, you must report um, on, only code M86.9. Now, there are three body sites in the body that do not require um, acuity. And that's because they appear at the same indentation level. And I would recommend that at the conclusion of the presentation, you get out your ICD-10 index and have a look a little more carefully at the item that I've identified on this slide. Um, jaw, orbit, and vertebrae all appear at the same indentation level as acute, subacute, and chronic, therefore telling us that those three um, do not need acuity stated with them. But I wanted to bring that to your attention because that's something that many folks have not noticed and um, has tremendous impact on whether or not we will be doing queries with respect to that. 
Next, I want to talk about another item that is completely different from ICD-9 into ICD-10, and this is actually a huge improvement. And this is, a, um, and this is true for both acute cerebral infarctions and late effect of cerebral infarctions with weakness. And here we have the question, individual admitted due to a cerebral infarction. The final statement says acute cerebral infarction involving the right hemisphere with left-sided weakness. And the very specific statement given to us is, question, how should left-sided weakness due to an acute cerebral infarction be coded when there is no specific mention of hemiplegia or hemiparesis? Um, and the answer is, um, frankly, when unilateral weakness is clearly documented as being associated with a stroke, it is considered synonymous with hemiparesis and hemiplegia. And this is a huge difference from ICD-9. Back when we had coding clinics that told us that a stroke um, with, hemi with weakness was to be coded as a, a stroke with weakness. And here we now have the very specific statement that tell us that in ICD-10, a stroke with weakness is to be coded as a stroke with hemiparesis or hemiplegia, a huge difference. Uh, moving on, the other item that is um, completely different is how we would handle that for late effect of stroke. And the question here is pretty much the same. Patient admitted with a condition, but they have a history of an uh, um, an infarction with residual weakness, what is the appropriate code? And as you might expect, as we've talked about, late effect of a CVA with weakness is now considered to be late effect of a cerebrovascular accident with, um, with, with hemiplegia. Um, again, a big departure from the way we handled it in nine, but it's useful to know that coding clinic is telling us how to do that. So keep that in mind as you do your work in ICD-10 in upcoming weeks. Next, we have several coding clinics that are corrections to the classification. As we talked about, complete, um, building a classification, a new one, is a huge task. And what we've come to see is that there were some errors made. And these next few coding clinics tell us how to handle um, some of the errors that um, are found within the classification. Uh, exemplified by this first question, what is the correct code assignment for type 2 diabetes mellitus with diabetic ketoacidosis? And the answer here is um, assign E13.10, which you see the text, other specified diabetes mellitus with ketoacidosis without coma for a patient with type 2 diabetes. And right off the bat, the astute coders will notice that E13.10 is the code, as it says, for other specified diabetes, whereas type 2 diabetes is code E11. Um, and the answer here really speaks to the fact that there was an oversight in the creation of the classification, that there was, you know, despite the fact being a fairly common condition, um, ketoacidosis is not classifiable for type 2 diabetes. So, the instructions given to us are given the less than perfect limited choices, and that's coding clinic speak for they omitted it from the classification. It would be felt it would be clinically important to identify the fact the patient has ketoacidosis rather than the fact they have type 2 diabetes. Um, it points out that the National Center for Health Statistics, who has oversight for volumes 1 and 2, has agreed to consider correcting this, um, and we hope that they will do so. The answer really comes down to the fact that there is no right way to report this in ICD-10 for the moment. Therefore, Coding Clinic has chosen to let us, to ask us to report it incorrectly, but to ask us to do so across the board so that the industry has a standardized way of handling this, handling this situation so that each of us don't go off and make our own decision. So that in fact, code E13.10 would be a way that down the road for at least fiscal year 2016, we can keep track of patients with type 2 diabetes with um, ketoacidosis. And just because coders want to know the source of everything, I've shown you this page in the index. And as you go down the list, you see um, you see hypoglycemia with coma, and you see kidney complications. And right there at the bottom is where ketoacidosis should have been inserted, but it does not appear there, um, whereas it does appear for type 1 and um, other specified diabetes, but does not appear under type 2. So I just wanted to show you um, how that will be taken care of. While we're on the topic of diabetes, I did want to point out 
that ICD-9 and ICD-10 actually handle the phrase poorly controlled diabetes differently. ICD-10, the index gives us a range of synonyms for hyperglycemia. Out of control is in the index, poorly controlled is in the index, and inadequately controlled is there as well, all to be reported as hyper, with hyperglycemia. Whereas in ICD-9, poorly controlled was always to be classified as not stated, as uncontrolled, a double negative meaning poorly controlled was always reported as controlled diabetes. And now that is completely different in ICD-10 as well, um, structured, given to us by the index. And I wanted to bring that to your attention for future work that you might do. And as long as we're talking about with hyperglycemia, the question that always arises, what about diabetes with hypoglycemia? In ICD-9, hypoglycemia with diabetes was classified to code 250.80, um, whereas, which is a catch-all in ICD-9, including that is where diabetes with osteomyelitis, so sort of a, a, a big lump of conditions that were never able to be clearly um, classified a catch-all, but now in ICD-10 we have some very specific codes to, to give us to report type 2 diabetes with hypoglycemia, um, classified under E11.64, and wanted to bring that to your attention as long as we're talking about things that are completely different on the topic of diabetes. The other problem with the classification the coding clinic has chosen to address and repair um, is a rather complex one surrounding the topic of esophageal varices. Um, this is the next six slides, and that's when you, how you know this is a very complex topic, when it takes six slides to actually explain it. But we have the clinical circumstance, patient with hematemesis presents for an EGD. The patient is found to have esophageal varices, um, and ligation via band device is performed. And the question is very complicated. What is the appropriate ICD-10 PCS body system for esophageal varices, the GI system, or lower veins? And that seems like an odd question. Um, okay, it's um, esophageal varices. Is it the gastrointestinal system or the vascular system? And the question you might wrinkle your forehead going, why are we asking about lower veins? Well, because what's being ligated are esophageal veins. And much to my surprise when I looked it out, looked it up, the esophageal vein is actually a lower vein, the dividing point in the body, as you know, being the diaphragm, just like in CPT. Upper part of the body is above the diaphragm, lower part is below, lower veins coming off the inferior vena cava. And in fact, the esophageal vein originates in the inferior vena cava, hence the question GI system or lower veins. Um, the question goes on to say, and a bit of an explanation, in ICD-10, the ligation is coded to the root operation occlusion. Okay. If we use table 06L, and the next several slides I'm going to show you the tables explicitly so you know exactly what this is about, for occlusion of lower veins, there is the appropriate body part, meaning esophageal vein, and a device for the, the bands. However, there is no approach value for via natural or artificial opening endoscopic, which is the means by which that procedure is done, down the throat to the esophagus. Um, however, if we use 0DL for occlusion of the GI system and use the esophagus, and intuitively you know right off the bat that's not the correct answer because it's not the esophagus that's being ligated, there is the appropriate approach value, but no device option for the bands. So the real crux of the matter is, what is the appropriate I-10 PCS code assignment for endoscopic banding of esophageal varices? And you know you're in trouble when the answer starts with a clinical explanation of what's going on. And here, um, this carefully constructed answer tells us that the varices are veins in the esophagus, which as you know, spontaneously rupture and cause bleeding. And the banding occludes the flow of blood, meeting the definition of the root operation occlusion. The lumen of the esophageal vein is being banded, not the esophagus. So in the index, in the index under ligation states C occlusion, which is the setup for our answer. And here, the answer is, and there we go, um, to assign the following code, 06L34CZ. And the text of that code is occlusion of esophageal vein with extraluminal device 
percutaneous endoscopic approach. And yes, right off the bat, you realize that like with the diabetes, the answer is that because there is no way to correctly code this in PCS, they have given us a construction by which we will report it incorrectly by means of standardizing the way we all report this for the first year. And the explanation is, in fact, that the I-10 PCS tables do not currently use approaches containing the phrase via natural or artificial opening for body part values in the cardiovascular system. During the construction of PCS, and it's, you understand how this could happen, no one considered that a certain vascular structure, the esophageal veins, would be approached um, and um, by a natural opening. Therefore, they neglected to put via natural um, or artificial opening. So the answer is through a percutaneous endoscopic approach. And it says use of this approach for body parts will be made over time if requests are made to the ICD-10 PCS coordination and maintenance process who have responsibility for fixing that problem. But let's have a look at how this code works and understand why the fifth character, number four, is incorrect visually. Here we have med surge section of medicine, lower veins as we discussed, occlusion is the correct root operation, the esophageal vein um, is what we are occluding, and percutaneous endoscopic is actually the answer, and it's, you know, it's incorrect as the approach, but it's the answer we're being given. Extraluminal device is the band that goes around the esophageal vein, and no qualifier. And let's have a look at the actual table that we would use, 06L, um, three, four, and here you see in under approach, we have, as you as we mentioned, no approach given to us via natural or artificial opening. So this table is completely otherwise the correct table with the exception of approach. Um, this table will likely be corrected for fiscal year 2017. Um, and be, be aware that this has, um, on the inpatient setting, considerable reimbursement issues. Um, you should um, take this code, run it through a grouper using the appropriate diagnoses and see what the implications are. Next, we're going to look at some coding clinics that correct previously reported incorrect coding clinics. We have several, and the first one pertains to placement of a portacath. And what I'm doing here next is showing you the incorrect coding clinic, the very first one from fourth quarter 2013. And first and foremost, I want you to make a note that um, this coding clinic has been rescinded and is superseded by a subsequent coding clinic that we're going to talk about in a moment. And as we go through it, you will see how, the, how easy it was for this mistake to be made in the early days of PCS before we all really clearly understood um, the use of the procedure classification. Very long coding clinic, but we jump in at the description that we are placing a venous access port. An incision was made in the anterior chest wall, a pocket was created, and the question is very specific. Not to the approach, but to what device character should we select for this um, procedure, and would a pour the cath be considered a um, vascular access device. In retrospect, it's easy to see how incorrect conclusion could have been reached. Um, at that time, the answer given to us was code only one code for the vascular access device. Um, and they explain how the device character is selected. It's a, it's a, it's a device, it's not a reservoir, and they give us the specific code and tell us that it is a percutaneous approach and give us a reason for choosing the percutaneous approach, a minor puncture or a, or a minor incision. And there you have that. However, in second quarter 2015, the most recent code in clinic given to us, this was reevaluated because of a question submitted by a questioner just like yourself and says in coding clinic and reverts back to the old coding clinic that we just reviewed, information was published about the device character for the totally implantable central venous device, the portacaf. And the questioner says, although we agree with the device value, which was the point of the previous question, we have to say that we disagree with the approach. Um, we believe the approach should be open rather than the percutaneous that was stated in the previous question. The questioner goes on to point out that furthermore, we think the portacath is a two-part device and that you should have been using two procedure codes and we're asking the coding clinic editorial board to revisit this question. 
And in response, Coding Clinic says you're absolutely correct. In the published example, a subcutaneous pocket was created under direct um, vis vision to access the port. Therefore, the approach should be open and not percutaneous. And we were incorrect in that. Um, in addition, the totally implantable port is a two-part device. And you are correct. The two codes should be used. And here we have on the next page um, the two specific codes that should be used. Um, 0JH60XZ and 02HV33Z, the first that are the placement of the device into the um, subcutaneous tissue and fascia by open approach. And secondly, um, the infusion device being placed into the superior vena cava. Um, the qualifier of this question is that this advice is specific to a totally implantable venous access device and not for a cut down. And that's what that's when the circumstances under which you should be using those procedure codes. And sort of the defense of their decision of the previous coding clinic was that most central lines are inserted percutaneously without creating a pocket. Um, but there you have that. This is an important update, making you aware of the coding clinic that is no longer valid um, and has been replaced by this second quarter, 2015. Next, we have another correction to um, some coding clinics. And here we have the very um, succinct, the patient presents for decompressive lumbar laminectomy. The surgeon performed an open, complete decompressive laminectomy of L3 and 4, as well as the same procedure on L5. Um, you note that this is being done on multiple levels. Question is, what is the appropriate root operation? Is this an excision or a release? And specifically, how do we code this in ICD-10 PCS? Um, and to answer the question, is this an excision or a release, one must ask the question, what is the distinct objective of the procedure? Was it the intention to excise lamina, or was it to um, release the spinal nerve? And the answer tells us that the decompressive laminectomy is done to release pressure and to free up the spinal nerve root. Therefore, the appropriate root operation is release. And to assign the following PCS code, and there you see it. Um, the important distinction here is that Coding Clinic fourth quarter 2013, page 116, advised that for this very same procedure, um, excision for the decompress should be used as the root operation for the decompressive laminectomy. And the explanation was that the advice was based when you go to the index that under laminectomy it instructs you to the root operation excision. Um, based on this question, the editorial advisory coding clinic board revisited the advice and determined the more appropriate root operation for this procedure is release. And you will notice that although the procedure was done on multiple levels, um, that only a single code, because the objective is to release the nerve, um, is used for the answer to this question. And that's how the um, cooperating parties would like this situation handled. And we bring this to your attention to make you aware of this change, whereas that you should no longer follow second quarter 2015, and you should follow the advice in this coding clinic. Next, I want to move on to some very good code coding clinics that empower the coder, that allow the coder to make some decisions and save us the trouble of having to ask, to go through the trouble of having to query physicians when that happens. And here you have the use of a report to confirm catheter placement. And the questioner asks, when coding the placement of an infusion device, such as a PIC line, um, the code assignment is based on the site where the device ends up. That's just one of the basic rules about um, device placement. Um, vascular device placement. And the questioner asks, for coding purposes, can imaging reports be used to determine the end placement of the device? A very reasonable question. Um, and the answer is, when the provider's documentation does not specify the end placement of the infusion device, the imaging report may be used to identify the body part. And this is a terrific coding clinic because it, it speaks to how we actually end up doing work. You will often see um, a PIC line being placed and the documentation telling us that the patient is going off to radiology to confirm the placement of that line. And um, the documentation can be read. And based on that documentation, we can then indicate the endpoint based on the radiology report. 
Um, worth pointing out that the Coding Clinic third quarter 2013 has an extensive explanation of how to actually report the placement of a PIC line if you wanted to review that um, that process as well. And I recommend that very useful Coding Clinic as well that we're not going to take the time to review here today. The other coding clinic that actually proves itself to be very useful is also about using imaging reports. And this is a very useful coding clinic because it does two things. It refers us to a previous coding clinic that tells us advice has supported the assignment of a more specific fracture code based on imaging findings when the physician has documented the diagnosis of a fracture. Q1 2013 tells us that when a fracture is being documented, we can go to the radiology report to determine the exact site if it is not given to us in the physician documentation. So this coding clinic refers back to a previous coding clinic before asking the question, does this same advice hold true for other conditions that can be better specified based on imaging reports? And the question is asked, for example, if a patient is diagnosed with a cerebral infarction or hemorrhagic stroke, can the imaging results be used to identify the specific vessel associated with these conditions? And the answer to this coding clinic is, yes, it's appropriate to utilize reports to provide greater specificity of an anatomic site. Therefore, if a patient is diagnosed with a cerebral infarction or hemorrhagic stroke, it is completely appropriate to utilize the imaging report to um, report the site of the infarction or stroke, um, something in ICD-10 that the diagnosis classification allows us tremendous specificity for site of artery involved in the hemorrhage or stroke or hemisphere or location within the brain of the stroke. So there we have that. Um, our next range of coding clinics are those that address certain complex issues. Um, complex issues um, such as, um, we're going to start by looking at issues surrounding long-term care. Um, fourth quarter 2014 provides us with about 15 questions um, of different scenarios of patients entering into long-term care and how we might code their situations. Um, pretty much everything you might imagine allowing us to work through those kinds of circumstances. Um, for example, there are the range of those 15 coding clinics talk about how to code late effect of stroke and related conditions, how to code an admission for physical therapy following an injury, um, continued treatment of a range of conditions including myocardial infarction um, after a patient has gone from acute care into um, long-term care. Um, but the question I've chosen to address here is actually one about um, continued treatment of an injury in a long-term care facility. Patient admitted to long-term care might be rehab, might be a skilled nursing facility, might be long-term acute care, following hospital treatment of a fracture of the right femur. The reason for the long-term care admission is to allow the patient to regain strength and for the fracture to heal. And that explanation alone helps us understand that this is not active treatment, but this is subsequent care. And the questioner asks, what code is used to describe the long-term care admission? And the answer is, as you might expect, a sign, and that's the code for fracture, with the seventh character of D for subsequent care, a subsequent encounter for a closed fracture with routine healing as the first sequenced or principal diagnosis. The seventh character of D for the encounter after the patient has received active care, as we've just discussed, code any other coexistent conditions as I know you would. But the last instruction tells us to not to code or assign an aftercare Z code as we might have done in ICD-9. And one of the points of that statement is, is also um, you can't use an aftercare Z code because most of the trauma aftercare Z codes, if not all, have been deleted from ICD-10 forcing us into using um, the trauma codes with the seventh character construction that is actually a, an excellent way of reporting one of, the tr one of the great new improvements. It's a lot more work, it's a little more complex, but will provide tremendously better data. Uh, which leads us to um, official coding guideline 20.a.2. There are actually regional requirements with respect to external cause codes. Not everyone is required to use them, although many of us are. Um, this guideline tells us 
Um, and this is really the departure from ICD-9 into ICD-10. In ICD-9, for those of us that reported external cause codes, we only reported it once at the initial encounter. And in ICD-10, this guideline tells us to assign an external cause code for the entire length of treatment. Um, and this works because we are then able to use an external cause code with a matching seventh character for the injury, whether it be initial, subsequent encounter, or sequela for each encounter for the injury which is being treated. At the bottom, I've provided an example of perhaps the case we've just looked at where this patient is being admitted to long-term care for treatment of the fracture, seventh character of D, a femur fracture, a subsequent encounter. And if we knew the cause um, of the injury, for example, if the individual had fallen from the ladder and fractured their femur, we would then be indicating with an external cause code um, and actually, that's the wrong code there. That should say w, W11XXXD, and I apologize for that. Um, what happens is that W11 is the correct code for falling from a ladder, and you would use the seventh character of D that would match the seventh character for the injury code for that episode of care. Uh, the other complex issue that we want to talk about um, multi that Coding Clinic has given us, this might be the, the single best Coding Clinic ever given to us first quarter 2015 because it provides 26 questions and answers as to how to appropriately apply seventh characters for injuries um, and poisoning where we do apply seventh characters. Um, practically every single circumstance that you could imagine an injury to occur, um, there are examples. Um, tremendously useful coding clinic, provides great clarification, and I recommend reviewing it. Um, but here, I would like to talk about how coding clinic, in concert with those examples, has taken the opportunity to bring to our attention an improvement to the guidelines that occurred in 2015. The guidelines in 2015, up until 2015, always said um, the seventh character of A, the initial encounter, is used while the patient is receiving active treatment. Examples of active treatment are surgical treatment, emergency department treatment, and encounter and continuing treatment by the same or a different physician. And that third statement was always been confusing to almost everyone I know. Um, the key here is they meant to emphasize character A for evaluation and continuing treatment, but people were always confused by the end of the sentence that said by the same or different physician, making them wonder if the patient saw a different physician, did that mean that they had to use a seventh character of A? And coding clinic, um, well, let, let's have a look at the next slide. Guideline 19.A in 2015 was updated, and that guideline was updated with an additional paragraph that says, while the patient may be seen by a new or different provider over the course of treatment for an injury, assignment of the seventh character is based on whether the patient is undergoing active treatment and not whether the provider is seeing the patient for the first time. And there is the key. The key is whether or not they're undergoing active treatment. And you see here that paragraph was added to the guidelines in 2015. And first quarter 2015, in conjunction with that, reiterated that guideline. Um, coding Clinic um, taking to mind that not everyone keeps up to date on every single resource. If you read the guidelines regularly, you saw this and you got it. But if you happen to miss it in the guidelines, you saw it in Coding Clinic. And so Coding Clinic took the opportunity to reiterate this very important guideline update. There's reiter and I, so on real topic of reiteration, I want to point out that the 26 examples in that Coding Clinic are tremendously useful and explain a great deal. And I highly recommend having a look at those. However, this first quarter 2015 Coding Clinic within its 26 examples um, bring to light a very important um, concept how we code seventh characters for complication codes. Um, the example that they use, and it's a fairly common enough example, is that of an infected prosthetic joint. And while the patient may have the prosthetic joint removed and may go on to subsequent locations, um, um, long-term care or return back to the acute setting, and, or even if they're receiving intravenous antibiotics you know, at home, 
or in the outpatient setting, would require a seventh character of A because that infection, although the infected joint may have been removed, is still receiving active treatment and therefore the seventh character of A is appropriate. I wanted to bring that to your attention. One very specific um, example included in those 26 examples. I also want to point out um, an older code in clinic that talks about treatment of complications. First quarter 2014, because there's an awful lot of information in this coding clinic how to handle certain situations. How should a non-healing surgical wound be coded? And the answer very quickly is that there is no code in ICD-10 for a specific code to describe a non-healing surgical wound. And therefore, you should use the catch-all surgical complication code T81.89X um, and your seventh character to be determined depending on the episode of care for an unspecified non-healing surgical wound. And you know, right off the bat, most people look at that and say, how can that be if I-10 is such a tremendously improved classification? And what we point out is that when we had ICD-9, it took years before ICD-9 had a specific code for a non-healing surgical wound. And that was given to us through the um, code update process um, many years ago after ICD-9 was given to us. And you can expect that being such an important um, clinical condition, we will receive an updated code for this as well in ICD-10 very shortly. But this coding clinic wants us to be aware that as of such, there is no code. And again, to standardize our reporting of that condition through the code T81.89X. This coding clinic goes on to point out that if there is specificity, if the wound is not healing due to an infection, assign a post-procedural infection code, and if the wound was closed at one time and is no longer closed and is not healing for that reason, the disruption of a surgical wound not elsewhere classified should be coded. Um, useful specification for all of us. The third um, complex issue that coding clinic has chosen to address, and we appreciate this, is that there are 16 questions and answers surrounding the issue of mechanical ventilation. And that, um, first of all, it goes on to explain to us um, through a summary of mechanical ventilation and certain definitions and issues, um, the three new procedure codes for um, in PCS for reporting mechanical ventilation. And you see the structure is a little different than it is in nine, the first code being mechanical ventilation less than 24 consecutive hours, and, our, and the two that actually mirror um, the rest of ICD-9, where we have up to 96 consecutive hours and um, greater than 96 consecutive hours. So you see the first two codes, 5A1935Z and 5A1945Z equate to code 9671 in ICD-9, and 55Z equates to 9672. Um, the coding clinic questions, as I mentioned, are a summary of mechanical ventilation, definitions of mechanical ventilation, a discussion of the different modes of delivery of ventilation, and um, when it's appropriate to code the, the insertion of an endotracheal tube and when not to. But here we have a very important coding clinic um, that addresses one of the most frequently asked questions we, uh, we, we see. And here we'll see the clinical circumstance. This is first paragraph has been truncated. You see this is a patient who has respiratory failure and is um, on a ventilator. Um, whether or not this is in a long-term care hospital or not, the issue is really the same. And they go through a very long explanation that on day one, you know, the weaning process begins, and day two they describe, and three, et cetera. And on day five, the ventilator was turned off. And according to the clinical protocol at our facility, raised by the questioner, the patient is not officially weaned until he has been totally off the ventilator for 72 hours. And we hear this from many people, that although the patient, the ventilator is turned off, they are evaluated completely, and in many instances, the ventilator is not removed from the patient's room for a few days afterwards in the event that they require um, reinstitution of the ventilation. And the question really is, can we count the additional 72 hours as vent time since evaluation and monitoring is part of the weaning process? And we hear this question all the time from lots of people who want to get this um, answered correctly. And the answer is really giving us what becomes the distinction between the clinical definition of respiratory or ventilator weaning and the coding definition. And here the answer is, for the preceding question, 
assign code 5A1955Z respiratory ventilation greater than 96 consecutive hours since the ventilator was turned off on day five. And you see here that they conveniently avoid the issue of, you know, if this was on day four, would we call it greater than 96 because four days plus 72 hours would, would kick you over into the 96 plus hours. However, the answer is greater than 96 hours. But the key to this and the decision process is really that after the mechanical ventilation is turned off, it's not appropriate to continue to count ventilation hours even though the patient is continually being evaluated. And this is the distinction between the clinical definition, the additional 72 hour evaluation, and the coding definition. When they, when they turn off the ventilator, it's off and you stop counting. And if the patient never resumes mechanical ventilation, that is how the hours are counted. The additional 72 hours that the patient is being evaluated is not included in ventilation time. And this coding clinic is very important because um, at this point in time, um, hours of mechanical ventilation is on the, uh, on the Office of the Inspector General's um, work list, work plan. Um, for 2016 and that they will be requesting records and counting the number of hours on the vent and we are obligated to follow this coding clinic in um, response to um, their evaluation. So keep that in mind. Um, and that's um, the end of the coding clinics that I really wanted to review for today, but I have some other items I want to talk about. The first is that you should be updating your reference documents if you haven't already done so, that there are subtle changes from the 2015 to 2016 guidelines, and they were released to us actually in June, uh, June 22, 2015. You can find these on the CMS website. You can find them on the Walters Kluwer Medi-Regs website um, quite easily. Um, you have the ICD-10-CM guidelines, you have the PCS guidelines, and you have the very important document that you may not be aware of, which is the PCS reference manual for 2016. And the reference manual is an exquisite document. It was developed by 3M, the developers of the PCS classification, as sort of an owner's manual for the PCS classification. Um, if you haven't read it, I recommend having it in your possession. I recommend reviewing it before we start coding next week. Tremendous information that we're going to talk about a little bit more. And lastly, um, one of the items I recommend that's available on the Walters Kluwer Medi-Regs website is the AHA ICD-10-CM and PCS coding handbook with answers. It's been updated in August of 2015 with the 2016 version. The availability of this publication um, on, the, on, on many regs is, is simply a gift. To be able to access it easily and quickly, I do it all the time. It's quicker than searching for the book on my bookcase and opening it, and I bring it to your attention. Um, but on the topic of the PCS reference manual, let's have a look at why updating that is really quite important. Um, in addition to looking at the PCS reference manual for 2016, I recommend you look at the addenda because the addenda tells us what's different from 2015 into 2016. And one very big important difference was an update that was made um, in one of the examples. Um, in 2015, it was on page 72. In 2016, page 71. It's how we code an anterior colporophy with polypropylene mesh reinforcement by open approach. Um, like coding clinic, the reference manual revisited this and determined that the previous advice on how to report this was incorrect and updated their advice. So here you see in 2015, this procedure would have been reported um, 0UUG0JZ. And let's have a look at that carefully as compared to 0JUC0JZ. And as you look at it, you'll notice that it's the second and fourth characters that are different. The second character um, um, is the body system, and the fourth character is the body part. So here, what's different and what's been updated, um, in 2015, the body part was, the body system was considered to be the female reproductive system, and the body part was the vagina. And after careful evaluation, the conclusion was reached, you know, using the definition, what is the distinct objective of our procedure, it was changed to 
body system being J, subcutaneous um, tissue and fascia, and the body part being fascia of the pelvic region, based on the idea that the distinct objective of the procedure was to supplement um, and it's suppl the we use supplement because, by definition, supplement is using a synthetic device to bring a body part back into its normal function. So with that in mind, you see that they came to develop a better understanding of what the distinct objective of the procedure was and that it was, in fact, within a different body system. So um, keep in mind that this information is available to you in the PCS reference manual. But this is also an example how Coding Clinic, Q4 2014, um, in concert with the PCS reference manual, improves our understanding. Now this question here um, is a little bit different in, and let's have a look at how it works and how they are both different and the same. How is an open posterior colporophy rectocele repair coded in PCS? Should one or two codes be assigned? Okay, and here you have a long explanation, and but the key is that the site of the repair of the procedure is the pelvic region fascia, which is exactly what the um, PCS reference manual update um, made the change to recognize. Talks about the posterior colporophy is the surgical intervention for repair of a rectocele. Um, that we're, the idea is to tighten the laxity of the fascia. So there you have that, and we have a single procedure code given to us that helps us recognize the correct way to code that procedure code. Um, lastly, I want to talk a little bit quickly about a PCS, uh, the inpatient prospective payment update to the final rule. Well, the final rule was given to us on August 17, 2015. Um, there were no new, as you're probably aware, diagnosis codes. However, there are new PCS procedure codes, and if, um, they are given to us in Table 6B of the final rule. And let's have a look at how that works. And the first question you might ask is, how can there be new procedure codes? I thought we were under a code freeze. And like most rules, there are loopholes. And the loophole here is that um, the rules always told us, told us that there could be additions to the classification to capture new technologies and diagnoses as required, and that they cite the public law that tells us that it's the case with which we may do so. So there we have that. Um, we have new codes tatted to the med surge table 047 to reflect some new um, procedure codes um, under dilation of arteries. And this quotation tells us that these codes will be implemented. That language came to us from the proposed rule, and most items in the proposed rule were given to us to um, the new codes were given to us this is usually proposed is what's the case, but this is telling us that there is no choice. We have new codes and that they're going to be implemented. Here we have four new tables, 047 and, and all the way down to XW0. And you probably notice that X is um, a rather new concept we're going to talk about in some detail. On table 047, it's the med surge section of medicine, treating the lower arteries specific in the, in the area of dilation. And what happened is we're being given a new seventh character of one. One reflects that the procedure is being done by means of a drug-coated balloon. So one example that might occur there is dilation of the right femoral artery, drug-eluting intraluminal device, meaning placement of a stent, but by means of a drug-coated balloon. Um, the angioplasty is done with a balloon coated with a drug intended to prevent restenosis. So there we have an example of a code from that. But let's have a look at the tables. This is what that table 047 looked like in 2015. And as you go down the list, you'll notice um, the femoral and popliteal arteries, K, L, M, and N, at the lower part of that page are listed there. And you see the terms you would expect. Um, moving across the road to the right. As we look at that table in 2016, you'll notice that those four arteries, in fact, two arteries, lateral, right, and left, have been moved to their own distinct row at the bottom of the table. And you'll notice on the far right, um, what's different, and this will go back for a second, 
you see that there's under qualifier there was no qualifier in, t in 2015 and in 2016 we have two qualifiers character one for the drug coated balloon and Z for no qualifier and let's take a quick closer look let's make that a little bit bigger to see how it works knowing that once you've selected your artery you have to move according to the conventions of the PCS classification from left to right um, femoral artery right left popliteal right and left um, open um, the device as well as the drug coated balloon as our seventh character so you see how that would work and how that is distinctly different now we have our table for new technology um, this is an orbital atherectomy and you see that the structure on the left for the coronary artery treatment is the same as it is for treatment of all other coronary arteries but you'll notice the third column instead of saying simply device it says device substance or technology and here you would pick an extirpation by orbital atherectomy we're going to talk about exactly what that is in a moment and its qualifier is that it is a new technology group and the reason to get this right is that as a new technology there is new technology add-on payments associated with it so using this po this code would hopefully trigger that um, additional reimbursement the orbital atherectomy is similar to a rotational atherectomy, abrades plaque from within the lumen of the artery, the vessel, very high speed. The debris is made small enough that it can pass through the body harmlessly, um, no embolic complications. So that's why this is an important new addition to the arsenal for treatment of coronary artery disease. Next we have new technology um, in the area of joints, monitoring left knee right knee and this is an intraoperative knee replacement sensor new technology group and let's look at how that works basically this is a device used during the course of the procedure does not remain in the body at the conclusion of the procedure that is intended um, to balance the knee joint the artificial joint that is being placed to prevent um, wear um, knowing um, the magnitude and the location of the tibiofemoral forces can help an accurate balancing of the synthetic joint. This is probably best, um, the best analogy I can think of is getting the front end of one's car aligned so that the tires wear evenly. Um, similar, similar notion used with respect to knee arthroplasty joint. So next we have new technology. Um, this is certain medications. Um, for introduction XW0 placed in either the peripheral vein or central vein which is the same construction we have for introduction of substances um, but as you look the substances and there are four of them the ceftazidine avibactam and the other three substances we're going to talk about in a little more detail um, it's worth pointing out now that I think of it that although we have new technology codes just going back for the the joint it was intended that this new technology actually be um, approved and it turns out that we were given the table in advancement of the approval of that technology so while we have a code for the use of this sub this device it has not been approved for additional technology per the federal register and I bring that up as we talk about the four new medications that were added to the um, in the introduction table the ceftazidine avibactam complicated UTIs and intra-abdominal infections that was intended um, for drug resistant organisms and this while they had high hopes was not approved for um, new technology add-on payment whereas the other three medications the second one um, the anticoagulant reversal agent for patients that are anticoagulated that need surgery urgently and don't have time to go through the process of reversing their anticoagulant this can be given making surgery safe on those individuals to prevent bleeding the third medication is for treatment of aspergillosis and related fungal infections and the fourth is um, anti-neoplastic immunotherapy and the last three actually have um, new technology add-on payments associated with them um, what is the new technology X well this was brought about in 2014 at the coordination and maintenance meeting um, the industries were adamant that we needed a way to report um, codes that were not in the table a quick way to get them out there and CMS agreed um, the objective is really to give us new technology add-on codes very quickly as well as other codes that we want to be able to report that may not have 
been presented yet to the CN coordination and maintenance meeting. On the topic of the coordination and maintenance meeting, it's worth noting that the coordination and maintenance meeting occurred this week. Um, Tuesday and Wednesday of this week, and while it may not seem useful to tell you about a meeting that were, was yesterday, um, be aware that these are recorded and are available on the CMS website and summarize the future of where the CM and PCS classification is going with respect to recommendations. Um, and because these are recorded, you can listen to them and actually get CEUs for listening to those as well. Um, new technology section X codes. Um, Basically, um, they're like category three codes, where after they serve their purpose, they will either graduate and become actual PCS codes, or they will be deleted from the classification. Um, so that similarity to CPT occurs with the PCS procedure codes. They, they either um, get to be join the adult codes at the adult table, or they are, they are, they're sent outside to play, I suppose. Um, lastly, a couple of DRG changes. We've lost two DRGs, 237 and 238, major cardiovascular procedure with and without major comorbid condition. Um, and there we have, um, they're replaced by five new DRGs that have additional specificity within DRGs 268 and 269 with respect to certain complex aorta procedures and heart assist procedures. Um, and the remainder of them being in 270 through 272 as they were before. Um, lastly, we have new procedure, new DRGs to reflect the movement of some other um, percutaneous intracardiac procedures out of some other DRGs into these new categories. And you can see I've given you the page numbers in the Federal Register that if this is important to you and you find this interesting, you can go there and review all the information as well as the tables that tell us what procedure codes are included within those DRGs. At this point, this concludes my presentation. I encourage you strongly to go back and take this opportunity before ICD-10 begins to review all of the coding clinics and not just the ones that we've reviewed here today because they work as a supplemental classification to the conventions of the classification and the guidelines and therefore um, are, are incredibly useful with respect to the work that we'll be doing in upcoming months. Um, so uh, thank you very much. and. Do we have time for questions? Um, we do, but I'm going to turn the mic over to Christina Panos to do a quick demo of our product. I know there's a couple of questions on how we can get coding clinic, and Christina can show you how uh, some of the folks on the phone can get that from us. Very good. And then we'll Thanks. Get Thanks, Maria. Are you seeing my screen okay at this point? Yeah, it's perfect. Thanks, Chris. Wonderful. Um, so I do want to show focus on, on the coding clinic for ICD-10 specifically, but also show you some of the other ICD-10 resources that are available within our coding as well as our compliance suites. If you have really any level of our products, you have ICD-10 uh, resources at your fingertips. Uh, and in our most comprehensive products, um, we're actually looking at the Audit Revenue Resource Center, which is our top tier product in the coding suite and the ICD-10 workspace, um, you actually have in those top tier products things, uh, advanced titles such as your AHA coding clinic and the AHA uh, ICD-10 coding handbook as well. Um, you have access to all of the code books uh, under codebooks and guidance, so all of your current code sets. Um, but here I can also directly access my ICD-10 coding clinic. So you can see that you have both your I-9, I-10, I as well as your coding clinic for HixPix, uh, where I can view specifically, I could search, or I can browse by opening up the folder views and actually review the entire uh, the entire issue. Uh, I can search within this collection, so I can search for the term lithotripsy as an example and be taken right to any citations that is going to provide that information on that topic based on what was published. Um, also under code books and guidance, I have access to all my code, again, my code books, so I can access my SAD 10 CM book here. Uh, where I have access to not only the official coding guidelines, those are always in all of our code books, um, but I could browse or search as well. So when I'm searching in my collection in the code book itself, I'm also searching those guidelines, but I can walk into a particular uh, section and chapter and, and literally browse or turn the pages of the code book specifically and 
look at any given particular code. Uh, within a chapter, you will notice that there are section uh, chapter and section guidelines that are expandable and collapsible. And those are going to be right available right on page, so there's no flipping back to find that information. Um, we do blow out every code and we spell out every reportable code in bold, uh, as you're seeing down here. And because we do that both in our CM and PCS books, it does make those chapter pages quite lengthy. Uh, here you're seeing that all expanded, but we also added a feature recently that collapses that, so I can quickly jump to the section that is important to me. Uh, likewise, with our um, PCS book, uh, the guidelines are available right in the code book. We also have that PCS reference manual that Barry mentioned. Uh, as with the code book, I can search, or with the CM book, I can search, or I can, again, walk into a particular chapter uh, within my uh, PCS book um, and into the subsection to construct my specific code and all of those uh, reportable codes will be spelled out at the bottom of the page there. Now I do want to take a look, quick look at our, um, our Code Explorer feature. Um, our ICD, T, ICD Code Explorer, which is right here under Lookup and Payment Tools, is going to allow me to search ICD-9 and ICD-10 simultaneously. Um, and here I put in a search term of corneal ulcer, and so I'm seeing my I-9 results on my left side of my screen and my I-10 results on the right side of the screen. Um, no crosswalking at this point. We have included the gems. Um, so um, initially when I first search, I'm just seeing them side by side. Very apparent to me the level of specificity and expanded specificity in ICD-10 as I keep scrolling and scrolling on the right side. But at this point, I haven't crosswalked, and I can utilize those gems, the general equivalent mappings. We have all three versions, so I can actually uh, map using the gems to see how that particular procedure or term or diagnosis has crosswalked using those gems. So that's quite helpful. I also wanted to point out something specific that we've done, recently enhanced this Code Explorer to give you very quick access directly to those code books both I-9 and ICD-10. So there's some links right next to the first three characters here uh, linking me into that code book, taking me right to the specific page. So uh, once I've explored and gotten here, I'm getting some additional content surfaced for me right on screen. I also have links to LCDs. This is going to be based on jurisdictions or states that I've chosen, but it's going to identify for me any LCDs or NCDs that have specifically mentioned those codes. Also searches our coding guidance library. And this is a very robust library of, of um, CMS references. It does include code books. It also includes our new definitions manual, but we've also included a quick link um, and let me let me just pick one other uh, example here. It includes the coding clinics as well as well as the handbook. So here's a citation to that handbook. Uh, so I can quickly there were three references, and now I can quickly look at what was referenced in the handbook. Purely working from that Code Explorer screen, also uh, to the AHA coding clinic as well. The last link that you see on the right here is to our definitions manual. We just released this definitions manual um, to really en enhance your understanding of uh, DRG grouping, to kind of dis demystify that. Uh, it is laid out by MDC, but here where I've searched, it's identifying specific areas within the collection. Uh, that have referenced that code, and within each MDC page, it's going to give me links to DRG payment information as well. So this is quite a fabulous resource that we've just recently um, enhanced. Again, it's going to be organized by the different MDCs, but also has additional indices um, to support crosswalking and hack, uh, uh, co giving me a list of CCs and hacks, et cetera. Um, well, I know we're butting up against the end of our, um, our session today. I just want to point out we do have a number of other resources that are going to be available to you within our coding and compliance suites. We also have a DRG grouper and calculator that is fully ICD-10 ready as well. So Maria, let's, I'm going to turn it back to you if we have a moment or two to answer any questions. Um, 
or are we out of time at this point? Maria? I'm sorry, I was talking on mute. Sorry about that. Yes, um, we are out of time. However, um, for those of you that want to stick around for um, a few questions, um, we will download all questions um, at the end of today's presentation, send them off to Barry, and he will answer those, and those will be available in our product, as well as there are quite a few questions about um, how to, you know, whether or not we have archives and, um, you know, whether you can uh, get access to the indices in uh, the ICD-10 code book. And yes, those are all available in our tools um, and uh, a way to, uh, so actually, before we get started <laughs> into questions, because we are over, let me address a couple of questions that are not that difficult um, and not in depth where, um, Barry, if you're there still, um, can you define active treatment? Um, it's a gray area that each provider determine on a case-by-case -case basis, or is there an actual definition of active treatment? Active treatment is not actually vague. There's actually a very explicit explanation of active treatment in the guidelines and in the coding clinic that I mentioned. But active treatment in general it's, almost, it's, hard. it's one of those issues where it's hard to answer the question without using the word active treatment in the answer. Um, it's generally with a relationship in time to, well, an injury is easy to understand, but the fact that the, I'm going to, I would like the opportunity to, to write that up. Absolutely. Could, just, just to kind of review the um, resources definitions of that, but, but I hate to say active is active. <laughs> no, absolutely, and so there is an actual definition, and we appreciate that, Barry, and I'm sure our attendees will look forward to that definition and some resources to support that. So there's another question for complications in home care. Do we use A or D in coding? Well, if the patient has gone home, um, complications, can you repeat the question? There were complications in... In home care, so home health care. Okay, so complications of medical care, for example. Um, well, it depends on what they're receiving at home. If, if a patient, for example, falls and, and has a, a fracture at the acute care setting, they would have a seventh character of A where the, the fracture was actively treated, perhaps the, the, a cast was placed, the bone was set. But once they go home, my understanding that it is that is subsequent treatment that they are no longer receiving active treatment for the fracture, you know, um, X-rays, um, reduction of the fracture, things of that nature, and that would be subsequent care. Um, character D. Perfect. Great explanation. Um, we'll do one more question, Barry. Um, can you use a screening diagnosis code and a personal history code on the same claim? for a surveillance colonoscopy? Okay, I would like to have that question written down and look it up. That's one of those. One, I th my understanding is that one of the problems we're facing moving into ICD-10 is many of the LCDs, as they would pertain to um, screening colonoscopies, have not yet been published, um, at least using ICD-10 codes. So it's my understanding that we don't have guidance in that respect. And having said that, I'd like the opportunity to research that again and um, make sure that is, in fact, the case. Absolutely, more Barry. More of a reimbursement question than a coding question, but the reimbursement is, is drastically affected by um, the sequencing of the code. So it's a, it's, it's a good question. Great. So what we'll do is we're going to wrap it up for now. Um, there are a lot of questions. So as I'm wrapping up, if you do have a question, please put it in. Uh, the question panel, and we will address it after today's presentation and have it available in the product. I want to thank everyone for attending the Coding Clinic Update with Barry Libman. We do have another session in a few weeks, so um, look, look to see that if you want to attend it again. Um, and then for those of you that asked about CEUs, sometime tomorrow afternoon you will receive an email from us as a registered attendee please take the time to take the survey. We will always want to know how to better serve you as our customers and potential customers. And then once you complete the survey, you will get the CEUs. So again, we want to thank everyone and thank Barry for a great webinar. And everyone have a pleasant day. Thank you.